Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Non-Catholic Catholic Podcast, and welcome and away to the Sunday School Hour for Victory Baptist Church for this Sunday, October the 18th, 2020. It is currently 10.03 a.m., so I'm starting about three minutes late. But yes, this is going to be kind of an, an <laughs> this will be kind of interesting. Uh, for the Non-Catholic Catholic Podcast, I'm basically, well, using this for the Sunday School Hour at Victory Baptist Church because we're live streaming everything today with no in-person services. Um, and and I, I really, I, my plan was to do something else, but I, I needed to, I need to kind of continue this discussion as well. So I, I hopefully I can get everyone caught up. If you missed the last episode of the Non-Catholic Catholic Podcast, well, you're kind of way, 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 way behind. All right, here's what happened. I, I don't know how I got how I came across the link. I don't know how I came across the video, but I ended up with a link to a video on YouTube of a Catholic ministry, uh, the Coming Home Network, uh, the ca- a Catholic ministry, where they were doing a video where they did a discussion, a kind of a discussion slash teaching on really the doctrine of imputation, or at least they were they were critiquing the Protestant doctrine of imputation. They were criticizing, critiquing the Reformed teaching on the doctrine of imputation. And so I, when I originally saw the video, I'm like, okay, well, you know what? I'm, I'm, I didn't even realize that the video was a part of this like lengthy series. They, uh, the, the, I think the part we listened to in the last episode was like part 25. And um, I just thought it was like, you know, part 25 of like all these different discussions, but I don't know how many, if you go, I went back and looked and I I think they've gotten like, I think they started looking at the doctrine of imputation, maybe on episode like 17 or episode 18. So they'd been discussing it for a while. So once we got into analyzing the video, I, I almost wanted to stop and go back and just start trying to find the first one and work our way through it. But um, I, in fact, at some point, I may have to do that where we can just offer a, a proper critique of all of their handling of the subject. But in the last episode, what became so frustrating to me, what became so irritating to me was they made a claim that us as non-Catholics, that the Protestant world, we have complicated the doctrine of justification. We've overly complicated it. Well, if anyone who has ever studied Catholic theology That's the most absurd thing I've ever heard in my life, because look at the Catholic teaching on justification. Look at how how you even hope to get saved. I have here in front of me an outline, kind of an outline that I've I've, I've put together from a number of sources, all taking quotes from the catechism um, of of basically how how one hopes to be saved in the Catholic system. You got to do this, you got to do this, and then if this happens, like you need a flow chart, right? You start here. And if this happens, well, then you go back to here. And if this happens, then you got to do this. And if you do this, then you can get here. And then if you get here, then maybe ultimately you'll get to have, I mean, ultimately in the Catholic system, I always, I, I, it's kind of a joke, but there, I say it with a little bit of seriousness. In the Catholic system of salvation, your hope isn't heaven. Your hope is purgatory. You just hope to get to purgatory. If you can just get to purgatory, you have a chance. You can't even hope or even think that you're going to get to heaven because your chances of committing a mortal sin are pretty great. And then your venial sin weakens the grace of God given to you. It's just a crazy, complicated system. And you've got indulgences. You can earn this. And it, uh, it's just, it's crazy how it all works. So um, I, I found it just absolutely disingenuous. They were disingenuous and not being honest to claim, hey, the, those, those Protestants, you overcomplicate justification. And I'm like, no, your system really overcomplicates it. I would say we, you could say we oversimplify it. That would be the, you would think the Catholic Church would, would criticize us as oversimplifying how one get, becomes saved. Not that we overcomplicate it because our teaching is pretty straightforward. So I address, I, I looked at what they said in the last episode. I offered a lot of critique, but one of the things they said is they argue that all of our teaching about the doctrine of justification based off this idea of imputation, and that's the idea that we are saved because of the impute, that, well, if you, if you want to understand how imputation works, I've got to just make this simple, that we believe that our sins are imputed to Christ, accredited to his account, then God poured out his wrath on Jesus Christ, 
judging our sins on Christ, right? And then Christ's righteousness is imputed to our account so that when God sees me, he doesn't see my sin, my failure, my shortcomings. He sees the perfect righteousness of Christ. Therefore, I'm accepted before God as being holy, as being pure, as being righteous, not because of an actual righteousness which I possess, but because of an imputed righteousness, which is accredited to my account, which is seen as being my actual righteousness. That's my hope to stand before God. And because of this imputed righteousness, then my hope is heaven. It's not purgatory. It's not, oh, I get a probational chance to to have a second chance here. No, it's not probation. It's actual salvation. And this is our teaching. And they argue that we, this whole teaching begins and that we take our teaching from the book of Genesis. So in the episode that I have queued up that we're going to work through, they claim that this is the claim in their last video, that in this episode, they're going to give us four reasons that we misinterpret Genesis um, and, and Abraham and that we misunderstand what's actually going on there. So we're going to listen to what they have to say and try to work through it this morning. But before we do, let's just do this. Right. I, I don't know. Uh, this is because I'm doing this for the Sunday school hour. I've got to try to make sure everyone in the church is caught up because I don't know who heard the actual last episode. They could be all way behind. But yeah, this is a uh, this is an important subject. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to I'm opening up my Kindle here. I'm going to go to the London Baptist Confession of Faith, the London Baptist Confession of Faith. And I'm going to go to the chapter on the doctrine of justification. Now, the members of Victory Baptist Church, we have read this uh, chapter countless times. I've obviously told you to read the London Baptist Confession of Faith over and over and over and over again because, well, you've got to have some kind of framework for what you're supposed to believe and why you're supposed to believe it. So here we go. This is very important, all right? This is on the doctrine of justification. You can also look at this uh, same chapter in the Westminster Confession it should be pretty similar, all right? Whatever you have available to you. If you don't have anything available to you, well, you can probably look up the London Baptist Confession of Faith online. So you should be able to look it up and follow along. Here we go. Here's uh, paragraph one on uh, the doctrine of justification. I believe it's chapter 11. Yeah, chapter 11 uh, of justification. Here we go. Those whom God effectually calleth, he also freely justifieth not by infusing righteousness into them, but, now this is very important, but by pardoning their sins and by accounting and accepting their persons as righteous, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but for Christ's sake alone, not by imputing faith itself, the act of believing, or any other evangelical obedience to them as their righteousness. In other words, we're not righteous because we did this or we did this or we did that. No, we are righteous because, and this is how the document states it, but by imputing Christ's active obedience unto the whole law and passive obedience in his death for their whole and sole righteousness uh, and, and that's what's considered for our whole and soul righteousness is the active and passive obedience of Christ. His active and passive obedience of Christ is accredited to my account, and that is my whole righteousness. It is perfect. It is complete. It's not lacking anything. Therefore, I can stand before a holy God, and judgment is going to pass over because there's nothing to judge. I have the perfect righteousness of Christ. All right? Um, and uh, see, and their passive obedience uh, in his death for their whole and sole righteousness, they receiving and resting on him and his righteousness by faith, which faith they have not of themselves, it is the gift of God. All right. And please note all the scriptures that are used to, ju- to, to articulate this doctrine. I want to make sure you understand this comes from Romans chapter three, verse 24, Romans chapter eight, verse 30, Romans chapter four, five through eight, Ephesians one, seven. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 30 to 31, Romans chapter 5, 17 through 19, Philippians 3, 8 through 9, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, John chapter 1, verse 12, and Romans chapter 5, verse 17. Now, the reason I state this is Genesis is not even quoted. Genesis is not even cited. Now, if we go look at some of these passages, Genesis may be alluded to, all right? But the teaching is, the, the supporting scripture 
for that doctrine that we just read all come from the New Testament. They're going to argue that it all starts in Genesis and we get Genesis wrong and that's why our whole system is wrong, all right? Um, Paragraph two says, uh, well, we'll just stop right there. We'll just stop right there uh, because you get the idea. That's, That's the doctrine of imputation. The imputed righteousness of Christ is accredited to my account. Therefore, I stand before God perfect and holy. He can say, well done, good and faithful servant. Why? Because of what Christ did for me. Christ did. He is the good and faithful servant. He was the perfect servant. He was the suffering servant. It's his righteousness. I can be judged according to works, right? Because the works that are accredited in my account are perfect works, right? So th- this is the this is our system. Now, I listen, I understand the Catholic Church rejects our system. They believe our system is anathema. They believe our system is wrong. They believe our system is condemned. But here is the thing that drives me crazy sometimes about Catholic, about the Catholic system is when Catholics want to start arguing with us about the doctrine of imputation or about any other doctrine, sometimes they want to start arguing like on the basis of the Bible, which drives me crazy because like, look, they shouldn't even, they shouldn't even have that. The argument is we don't get our teaching. This is the Catholic, should be the Catholic argument. We don't get our teaching from Scripture alone. So I don't have to disprove to you that the Scripture says something or doesn't say something because our teaching doesn't come from the Bible alone. The magisterial authority has declared this is the right teaching on the doctrine of justification. You are outside, or you are going against the magisterial authority. Therefore, you are wrong. Just say it that way. But then what these Catholic programs do, they try to act like all of a sudden they're Bible students and they start trying to argue scripture. And it's sometimes the most embarrassing thing. It's like you're not even handling the scriptures even halfway correctly. But they, so why even make the argument? The, the argument comes down to, is the church the authority to interpret the Bible? And if it is, then they tell you this is what the Bible teaches on justification and you believe it or the church doesn't have the authority. The strongest argument for Catholicism is an argument on authority. It's not their ability to interpret scripture because typically when they try to interpret scripture, they demonstrate a complete lack of actual skill in that area. Like Catholic Catholics are not known for their biblical exegesis. They're not known for that because their their whole argument really comes down to this is what the church says. This is what we believe. That's how they should make the argument. But for some reason on this program, they started acting, they almost started mocking that uh, well, that us as Protestants, we don't know how to read the Bible. We don't know, we don't know our Bibles. And it's like, what, what kind of nonsense is that? Right? I mean, the, the Protestant Reformation gave us Bible scholars, people who studied the Bible and, 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 and you know, just, ah, it's just crazy. So here's what they're going to do. They're going to go to Genesis chapter 15. In fact, let me grab my Bible over here. Genesis chapter 15. i make sure I've got the right verse here. I believe it's Genesis 15 is where they're going to go. And yes, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Speaking of Abram, right? Um, uh, it says... Uh, and uh, we'll go back here. I'll just, we'll start, start reading in verse one. We'll just start reading in verse one so that we'll have the, uh, we'll have the uh, full context. Genesis chapter 15, verse one. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what will thou give me seeing I go childless, 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 if I can speak right, and the steward of my house is El, uh, Eliezer, Eliezer of, D- of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And, and, uh, and uh, yeah, one and, uh, born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now towards the heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. This is all the promises of Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. We see everything going on. Abraham's trying to figure out, wait a minute, I still don't have a son. What's going on? I'm having a hard time understanding what you're trying to do. Nothing here makes any sense. And then we read this, verse six. And he believed 
in the Lord, Genesis 15, 6, speaking of Abram, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now, many believe that sets up the doctrine of imputation. Abraham believed God, and because he believed God, it was counted for him righteousness. Now, they are going to argue that we get that wrong, that our interpretation is wrong. Now, here's what we have to determine. Let's, we're going to listen to their argument and see if we get our interpretation of Genesis 15, 6 wrong. If we get it wrong, Here's the thing we, we have. We're, first, we're going to listen to them make the argument. And let's say that they, they prove that we get Genesis 15 wrong. If we get it wrong, then we have to ask ourselves, one, how do, how do New Testament writers utilize that text? Do they utilize it in a correct way? Does Paul demonstrate that he doesn't understand how to interpret Genesis 15, right? Or do we not only get Genesis 15 wrong, we get it wrong when it comes to how Paul handles the text, all right? Or, and then another question, another question we have to ask, even even if we get Genesis 15 completely wrong, is there enough biblical evidence outside of any reference to Genesis 15, 6 that would still prove the doctrine of imputation? Even if we throw out Genesis 15, 6 and any New Testament reference to Genesis 15, 6, if we throw all of that out, would we still have enough New Testament content to prove and support the doctrine of imputation. Those are some important things that we're going to have to think about and consider, all right? So are you ready? Here we go. This this is called the Journey Home. It is a a Catholic program. It comes from the Coming Home Network, which is a network dedicated to leading people back home to the Catholic Church because they believe that's obviously the true church. Um, the Coming Home Network, they produce a lot of programs, a lot of podcasts, and um, I, I try to keep up with some of their content. Um, and uh, so we're, we're going to listen to them. This is like, this is an ongoing series that they were doing looking at the doctrine of imputation. I think the reason they're doing, the reason they're doing this is because it's October and, you know, getting ready to move towards Reformation Day. So they're going after the doctrine, the, they're going after Sola Fide, uh, all of the solas, they're going after the solas. It looks like, like what they're doing, trying to say all these solas are wrong. All the solas are wrong. And so uh, so that that's what they're attempting to do. Great, wonderful. But uh, you know what they really should just do? They should Their program should be really short. All the solas are wrong because the Catholic Church says it's wrong. And the Catholic Church has the authority to define dogma and to declare what the Bible says or doesn't say. But they're trying to get into it like they're the biblical scholars and they're going to prove all of the reformed biblical scholars wrong. To me, that's a losing proposition for the Catholic Church. Like you're not going to win. I don't think you can win that. You just can't. There's just no way. You, you've got to do, you've got to twist some scriptures to some horrible, like you, you got to do some crazy, like I don't even know why you would want to get into an argument about biblical interpretation with a Protestant if you're a Catholic. We have the right to tell you what the Bible says. You're wrong. We're right. End of discussion. There you go. I mean, typically when the Catholic Church declare, when a, a, a Pope declares a dogma or they state this is the right way to interpret the Bible, they don't, they don't even really have to actually prove their, they don't even have to prove their work. It's like basically a kid standing up in math class saying one plus one is five and I don't have to prove it, okay? I can say what, this is what it is. Now, whether they're right or whether they're wrong, that's a whole different argument. But the point is they don't have to show their work. They don't have to show how they came up with the answer. They just declare their answer. And then that's the way it is. Now, Now, so it's really an issue of authority. It's not an issue of how well they can interpret the scripture, but let's see how well they can interpret the scripture, right? Maybe they're absolutely right. But even if they're right, we got to figure out the rest of the New Testament. So I'm interested to see what they do. I don't know what to expect here. I don't know what to expect. This is a situation I have not listened to this first. You know, I hate listening to it first because then I feel like I'm rehearsing my responses. So you know how this can turn out. This could turn out really good or this could turn out really, 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 really bad, right? I have no idea. So we're going to sit back. Hopefully the train doesn't leave the track. It is Sunday school. Hopefully members of Victory Baptist Church are listening. So if you are, you can jump into the chat and you can start offering your analysis. And if if you get stuck or if you're confused, ask the question. If we need to stop everything and just focus on that, we will. And um, so here we go. All right, everybody ready? Hopefully so. Hopefully my voice holds out here. Here we go. Um, I have a feeling we're going to definitely, 
I don't know how this is going. This may this may be a weird situation where this is this is going to probably go after eleven. So I I don't know if we're going to get too like. I, I needed to stop this at 11 and then do the next hour. I don't know if I'm not going to really worry about that. We're just going to try to finish this up in one episode. And if it goes longer than an hour, then it's just going to be Sunday school and Sunday morning combined. All right. But if we can, I mean, what it's October. What what better subject to, to, to discuss than the doctrine of the imputation? One of the key Protestant doctrines, right? So uh, we're just going to let the Catholics try to tear it apart and we're going to see, and that will help us. Uh, to be able to defend our faith and not be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. I'm, I'm basically trying to show you, I'm trying to do what the Bible calls me to do as a pastor, right? We're just doing it in kind of an interesting way. So here we go. See, and we're going to come to the objection again, but I can just feel, I mean, in my formerly reformed bones, I I can just feel the objection. Dry bones, ri- according ri- to Ezekiel, yeah. Yeah, I can just feel the objection rising. <laughs> One second. That is the uh, that's the uh, that's the one we did in the last episode. I think this is the one that we need to address today. All right, here we go. Hopefully, hopefully, I didn't download the the same one twice because if so, then I'm going to have to go download the other one live on the air, and that's going to be pretty boring to listen to. But here we go. All right, we're going to go to the other one. All right, I think I was playing the wrong one. Here we go. And I wanted to begin where virtually every treatment of the subject begins, and that is with our Father. Abraham, who had many sons. I am one of them. I, I think you are too. So uh, which arm do we start with first? I thought it was, let's it just the arm. praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Welcome to another rip roaring episode of On the Journey. I'm Matt Swaim, along with my colleague Ken Hensley, and we're with the Coming Home Network. If you don't know much about our work, we are a network of people from every background you can imagine: me, Wesleyan, Arminian, Nazarene, Free Methodist, and a bunch of other things. Ken, a former Baptist pastor, somehow we all ended up in the Catholic Church, and uh, this series of programs is uh, just one piece of us trying to explain ourselves and why it is that we would ever do a thing like that. So chnetwork.org, if you want to visit us, if you're in those shoes or have some questions of a similar ilk. Ken, how are you? I'm doing good, Matt. Good to see you again. Good to see you as well. And for those of our viewers who get all their theological talking points from Microsoft Word, when we're talking about being justified, we don't mean that your text starts on the left side of the page or the right side (laughs) of the page or aligns with both sides of the page equally. Justification in the theological realm, well, that's what we've been going through with you. So where are we today? Yeah, we're in the middle of an elongated series that we have titled A Damning System of Works Righteousness, because that's how many Protestants view the Catholic view of salvation. We're talking about the doctrine of justification in this series, Matt. And specifically, at this point, we're talking about the conception of justification that is the meaning of the word or the what happens in justification that I had when I was a Protestant seminarian and a Protestant pastor, and the conception that nearly all modern evangelicals, at least here in America, have, and that is that in justification, God is legally crediting to the account of the one who has faith the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ and declaring that sinner to be just or righteous in his sight. At the moment of justification, all of our sins, this is how the view goes, all of our sins, past, present, and future sins, which is an important point to have in mind, are forgiven. We are clothed legally in the perfect righteousness of Christ, and we can know from that moment, know that we have eternal life. And when we get into this, some people might be saying, well, gosh, you all are being so nitpicky about this, or you used to be so nitpicky about this as a Baptist pastor. Why can't we just say, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved and just leave it at that? (laughs) Yeah, I understand. I mean, someone, you know, maybe many people listening to this and going, oh, all this precise defining of justification, what it means, isn't this sort of like the, you know, the questions that they were working on in the late scholastic period, how many angels can dance on the head of a pen? Isn't this just useless and kind of, yeah, just dry, dry, you know, talk. 
No, it, it's not. And and here's why. Protestants, especially those who are from the more Reformed traditions, they believe that a correct understanding, and this is the correct understanding in their minds, of what justification is as legal imputation of Christ's righteousness is so critical that they that many of them will doubt that anyone could actually be a true Christian who doesn't hold this view of justification. Remember what uh, John MacArthur said. No, we'll stop right there. This is a very important question. Can you have the wrong, can you have a wrong view of justification and be a Christian? Because that would mean you have a wrong belief about how one is justified or how one is saved or how one stands before a holy God. Can you have a wrong like like there like just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved? Like like wait, Mr. Catholic you don't, you don't believe that. You don't believe you just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You don't believe that because I can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and still not be saved because I commit a mortal sin and I destroy the grace of God and then I have to have a special penance so I can get back into the grace of God so I can hopefully get to purgatory so I can have all my sins purged so that one day I can hopefully get to heaven. So you don't believe it's that simple. And even, even if I'm committing venial sins, that begins to destroy and weakens the grace of God. And then I have to either have the sacraments or confession or penance or an indulgence or something else to make up for that. Or I, I start increasing the amount of time I'm going to have to spend in purgatory. So it's not just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. But it's, it's yeah, I would say that either you believe... Uh, and what about the Council of Trent? The Council of Trent says if anyone basically says you're justified by faith alone, you are anathema. So it's not just us. It's not just the mean Protestants who say, hey, if you don't believe in the right doctrine of justification, you're not saved. I think the Catholic Church has kind of done the exact same thing. Okay? I think everyone does that. You've got to believe this way or you're not saved. We would have to we would have to argue that salvation has to have a belief in the right God. I think that would be uh, ooh, that's that's controversial. You got to believe in the right God, and I think you have to believe in the right gospel because I believe I could be wrong. I may be crazy, right? And and you know may, maybe this is not the right way to interpret this, and the Catholic Church may tell me I'm interpreting this the wrong way. But I think that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Galatia, and he said something like this. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you. Now, please note, we. Now, the we there would have to be the apostles, Paul's including himself. So that's apostolic authority. So Paul's saying, even if apostolic authority preaches any other gospel. Ap- now, remember, the whole Catholic system is based on apostolic succession, right? That they, the authority given to the apostles is handed down to the Catholic church, correct? Now, according to Paul, even if an apostle preaches another gospel than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed, damned, anathema. Now, just just because somebody could get confused and go, I think Paul just said that, that, and I don't know if Paul really meant that. Paul then goes and says, he repeats himself, as we've said before, so say I now again, if any man Preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received. Let him be accursed. Paul makes sure if anyone, if even an angel from heaven, angelic authority is not grounds to change the gospel. Apostolic authority is not grounds to change the gospel. No human authority can change the gospel. If you go against the gospel, you are anathema. So then we have to define out what is the gospel. And so therefore you have to be dogmatic. Here is the gospel. Any other gospel is not another gospel. It is accursed. It is damned. So, so I, you know, you, you can sit there and say, well, you know, those Protestants, they, they, w- they would even go so far to say that somebody who doesn't believe in their, their definition of justification is not saved. Paul did the same thing, okay? There's only one gospel. There's not 12. There's not 30. There's not 50. There's not 100. There's one, and we've got to figure out what that one is. All right. So I'm already a little concerned with, with where they're going here. All right. They're, 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 I, I just, 
I just hate when Catholics try to act like those Protestants are so mean. Oh, yeah, I know. Catholic Church never been mean. Not one time have they ever persecuted, locked up, burned, killed people. Not one time in their history. I can't even think of a time. You know, Spanish Inquisition. Never, never. Not one, not, not one time. Spanish Inquisition. Not one, not one time did they ever. No, never. Not once. Spanish Inquisition. I read this uh, last week. The difference between Rome and the Reformers is not theological hair-splitting. A right understanding of justification by faith is the very foundation of the gospel, he says. You cannot go wrong at this point without corrupting every other doctrine, and that is why every different gospel is under the eternal curse of God. And John MacArthur, Pastor MacArthur is the one who referred to the Catholic teaching as a damning system of works righteousness from which we got our title. So, so yeah, you know, to, to many of us, we may think, wow, this is this crazy hair splitting, but it's not to those who come from a Reformed tradition. And that's where I came from. And those are many of the people I want to talk to in, these, um, in this series, okay? Now, moving forward, as I explained last week to kind of tie this in with our last episode, I explained last week how holding this view of precisely what happens the moment we come to faith in Christ, it seemed to me to create terrible tensions with all sorts of other things that seem to be clearly taught in the New Testament. For instance, that perseverance in faith and perseverance and obedience are a condition for salvation, or that Christians need to continue to confess their sins and receive forgiveness. And I'm, I'm talking real time. As they and, happen. Yeah. It- Okay, I'm going to stop right there for a second. Uh, just so that everyone knows, I found I have in front of me the Council of Trent um, on justification. Okay, um, I think this was January 1547, if I if my memory is correct. Um, and I have the entire, yeah, the the entire uh, discussion here on justification from the Council of Trent. I believe this is session, I think it's session six. I believe it was session six of the Council of Trent. Um, And I believe it was 1574. And and so I have it here. So what I'm going to do is I will post, I'm going to post a link. I'll post a link right now in the chat for everyone in the church. Now, you need to pay attention to this and not start reading this. But I want you to have it because they're talking about, you know, you know, that, that the Protestants are the mean ones who said that, you know, you know, any other system is is damned. I, listen, no, your system damned us as well. OK, everyone is a cursing and damning each other. So let's not pretend that one person is the nice one and the other one is the mean one. OK, that's that's just not the way to do so. But here we go. I posted it in the chat right now. And uh, it should be there. So. Uh, we're going to go back and listen. I just, I just, I just, it just bothers me that that this is being framed in kind of a, you know, we're the good guys and they're the mean guys, and I, I just, I don't like that at all. But here we go. They got 33 minutes uh, to try to get through this. So how they're going to deal with this in 33 minutes is absolutely staggering to me. But that's okay. I can't get through an introduction in 33 minutes. But okay, yeah, okay, everyone laugh. <laughs> all right, here we go. As they happen, as a as an ongoing part of the Christian life. My definition of justification created tension with these because when you think of it, how can perseverance and faith and obedience be a condition for something that has been legally credited to me the moment I first believed? And and why would I need to confess sins and receive forgiveness when I've been forgiven all my sins, past, present, and future, well, in my life, about 44 years ago now? Okay, now here are Catholics who don't understand, all right? Here's the thing. When Protestants speak about Catholicism, I get irritated because they misrepresent it. And then when Catholics speak about Protestant theology, I get irritated because they misrepresent it. Now, yes, now make it very, this is very, 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 very important to make sure we draw a distinction here. It's very important. My legal standing before God, my legal standing before God, by faith, all of my sins are taken care of. So I do not need to make confession so in order to remain saved, because I, my I, the accredited righteousness of Christ takes care of my position, I confess my sins because of my 
fellowship and relationship with God, not my justification, not my legal standing before God, but because of my everyday relationship with God. My position is eternally secure. My fellowship, relationship with God can be hindered. My closeness, my communion with God can be hurt by ongoing sin, not repenting of that sin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, yes, they do raise an important question. How does the uh, Reformers' teaching on the perseverance of the saints, how does that fit in with the doctrine of imputation? Now, yes, MacArthur and many in the Lordship Salvation, they they hold this idea, look, if you don't do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, then you were never saved. Well, that goes seems to go against the doctrine of imputation. I will agree with that. And I've stated it before, and I'll state it again, that when you really get into lordship salvation, it's more Catholic than it is Protestant. So they, they, I, they have a, they, they raising good questions there, but they just need to understand that there is a positional reality of my faith, right? I believed in Christ. I am eternally secure. I am perfectly righteous. Nothing changes that. My sin does not change that. My sin does not affect that. So what does my sin impact? It impacts my fellowship and walk with God, not my position before God. And they, they should understand that. That's a pretty clear, clearly articulated position within Protestant theology. So they, they need to make sure they're fair and representing that. All right, here we go. It's See, kind so- of like the difference between how people think of brushing their teeth versus how they think of fixing their roof. You fixed your roof. It's there. You know how a roof over mm-hmm. your head. You're set. It's not like brushing your teeth where you're like, well, I woke up this morning and I ate some things. And so it's important for me to get the, my teeth back to their clean state. Especially when you're eating like just garlic cloves one after another for breakfast. Mm, old but, bait flavored cheese puffs in my case lately. There's just okay. not good enough. <laughs> you know the good. analogy that I've used in the past about the, uh, the educational analogy, okay? And I want to use it again. And take this in. I'm going to kind of develop this a little bit further than I have in the past. Okay, imagine that I tell you, Matt Swain, that from the moment you express sincere desire to have a degree from college, that you have it. From that moment, it's legally credited to your account. It's as though the, the diploma is hanging on your wall. You are a graduate, period. Okay. And then imagine I come back, you know, a few minutes later and I say, oh, by the way, Matt, as a condition for receiving your diploma and becoming a graduate, you're going to need to attend classes. You're going to have to listen to lectures. You're going to have to write papers and pass tests. And you're going to have to do a, you know, a, a you know, a thesis at the end and all. Okay. Imagine the confusion you would feel just immediately. And when you when you express that to me and you said, but Ken, I I, I thought you just said that the moment I first believed. You know I how it. I'd put it, Ken? I'd say, okay. you just gave me the cow. Why are you trying to get me to buy the milk? Yeah. You and, know? Yeah. And then I would explain it to you. I, I'd say, well, yeah, it's true. From the moment you expressed a sincere desire, it was credited to you, Matt. And I'm not really saying that going to school and passing tests is a condition for it. I'm just saying that if you really sincerely wanted it at the beginning, then this is the kind of guy you will be. You will be the guy who goes to school and passes all his tests and all that. And um, so I'm just describing the kind of person who had a sincere desire at the beginning. So yeah, that if you don't I'd do those like things. Those, those scams from the early 90s where they're like, you can get nine CDs from Columbia House for one penny. Oh, and man, then later you read the five I did those a couple like, times. <laughs> Wait, this is like $15 a month. You said it was a penny. You know, I mean, you just feel cheated if that's You're making me feel bad because I did that probably more than once back then. This is essentially, though, how I was forced to read a great number of passages in the New Testament with this kind of like, okay, it's now. Oh, it's later. And it's now. Oh, th- there's a condition. Well, it's not really a condition. It's just an, a description. Okay. This is how I was required to read. Okay. And then I come along. All right, they're not articulating it clearly, but I understand the struggle here. I do understand the struggle because, again, in the Protestant system, we say, hey, you believe in Christ. You are, you are declared perfectly righteous. The, Christ, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to your account. You are saved. And then we do have a tendency to come along and go, however, 
However, if you don't do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z, uh, if you don't do alpha, beta, beta uh, esch- echelon, echelon, I don't even know the Greek alphabet anymore, okay, uh, gamma, delta, okay, whatever, okay, if you, if you don't, if you don't do all of these things, well, then I'm sorry, you weren't really saved, okay, that's the thing we've been talking about for a very long time and trying to read, re, Refigure it out. We've been trying as a church for a very long time to go, wait a minute, uh, we need to really think this through. How does this work? And that, so I understand, yes, the Protestant faith sometimes seems to be saying two things. Hey, you believe in Christ? You're the imputed righteousness of Christ. You're saved. And then later on, we come along and go, uh, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, I don't know what you're doing over there, but you're not saved. Wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. You can't do that. Nope, nope, nope. You're not, nope, nope. You're not saved. You're not saved. And we spend all the rest of our time after someone believes, then we spend the rest of our time then going back to all the people who believe, then doing a follow-up test to determine if they really are. Well, if I'm saved because of the imputed righteousness of Christ, the only follow-up test you need to look to is the perfect uh, the perfect righteousness of Christ, his passive and active obedience. That proves my salvation, not what you see me do. Either either we believe in the imputed righteousness of Christ or not. So they are doing, a, they are do, they're not articulating it clearly, but they are at least bringing up a major issue every Protestant has to deal with. Every Protestant has to deal with this. Huh, how do we, how do we understand a belief that we are saved by the imputed righteousness of Christ, and at the same time, we find 50 different things that supposedly prove someone's not saved. And, and I understand that that's a, that's a, difficult, that's a difficult thing to try to, to try to walk that fine line because we don't want to just simply say, believe in Jesus and do whatever you, you want. We don't want to say that. But we have to, we've got, we cannot try to fix the, the fact that people may abuse the grace of God and abuse the imputed righteousness of Christ. We can't try to fix that abuse by then creating an argument that then basically throws out or goes against the doctrine of imputation. This all sounds very familiar because we've talked about this in our study with Romans. This this is what we cannot, we can't go, wait, the solution to people running around doing whatever they want is to then destroy the doctrine of imputation and then make salvation about works. You cannot do that. And I believe lordship salvation, unintended, maybe that wasn't the intended uh, purpose, but that's what they ultimately, it ultimately does. Hey, here's the 12 test. If you don't pass the 12, 12 test, you're not saved. But I thought my salvation was based off the imputed righteousness of Christ. I would have to take these tests. Like you could take the test that lordship salvation gives everyone. And guess who would have to pass that test? Jesus. Did Jesus do this? Did Jesus, oh, Jesus did all of those things. Well, then I'm saved. I don't have to pass the test MacArthur gives. I don't have to pass the test that Jonathan Edwards gives. Christ has to pass that test because it's his passive and active obedience who's accredited in my account. And if he passed all of those things, then I'm saved. So, so I do agree, Protestants, we say one thing and then we do another. We, we speak as Protestants and then we act like Catholics. So I can understand from a Catholic perspective, you're going, wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't really believe in salvation. You don't believe in a justification by imputed righteousness. You don't even practice that. They, that's a very good argument, and I'm glad Catholics make that because it should make all Protestants then relook at our entire system and go, wait a minute. How do we work this out to be consistent with the doctrine of justification? And I don't think sometimes that we are. We are. All right, here we go. To picking up Alistair McGrath's remarkable work, Eustitia Dei, that is the justice of God, the history of the Christian doctrine of justification. And I learned that this conception, this very definition of justification that I had been taught and that I had been, that I held and that I'd been functioning with and teaching for many years was brand new with the reformers. And I, I want those listening to hear what McGrath says, very well-respected Protestant theologian, professor at Oxford. This is what he said. Despite the the astonishing theological diversity of the late medieval period, a consensus relating to the nature of justification was maintained throughout. It continued to be held or it continued to be understood as the process by which a man is made righteous. The essential feature of the Reformation doctrine of justification 
is that a deliberate and systematic distinction is made between justification as legal imputation and regeneration or the doctrine of sanctification where we're changed, okay? He says where, I'm quoting again, where none had been acknowledged before in the history of Christian doctrine. A fundamental discontinuity. All right, now we got to stop here. This is the... This is the, this happens in all theological battles. This happens in all theological battles. Here's what you do. You have a system of belief and you say, okay, which one is the oldest? And if I can go back in history and go, look, 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 mine started at 222 um, AD. Yours started at 322 AD. I win. Mine's right because mine started before yours. Okay. Here is the question for, for Protestants. Now, for Catholics, this is, they're going to argue from a different perspective, and I understand this. But for Protestants, here is the question. We don't care who articulated it first. We don't care where it showed up first. Now, we care as far as our study of church history, and we like to know these things, and, and they do raise important questions. If no one articulated this for 1,500 years, if this is true, that this doctrine of justification, the way we understand, no one talked about it for 1,500 years. If that is true, that is disturbing. So, but, it, but even if it's true, here's the question we ask. Is it in the Bible? And if we find it in the Bible, even if no one else understood it for 1,500 years, which would raise some big questions, but even if that was true, all right, even if that was true, The fact is, if it's in the Bible, that's all that ultimately matters from the Protestant perspective, right? From the Catholic perspective, yeah, that history is important because it shows church tradition. And church tradition, magisterial declarations, those are key to finding truth. We would argue, is it in the Bible? Well, is it in Romans? Is it in Galatians? Is it in, in, in Ephesians? Is it in 1 Corinthians? Is it in all those passages that we looked at? If we believe it's there, then it's there. That is the question. So, and again, he found one, he found one professor who says it's never been there. I bet you we could find others who would argue it was there. All right. So that just make sure we understand that. All right. Let's let's go back and see what they have to say. It was introduced into the Western theological tradition where none had ever existed or ever been contemplated before. The Reformation understanding of the nature of justification, this exact definition we've been talking about, justification as the legal crediting of righteousness to the account of the sinner, he says the Reformation understanding of the nature of justification must therefore be regarded as a genuine, genuine theological novum. And this is where we were really getting off on on the, the topics last week, because this idea of taking justification and regeneration, and instead of making them part of this one thing, making them two separate things, mm-hmm. is so indicative of what happened with so many other doctrines in the Reformation. Taking faith and works, which are always meant to be kind of seen yeah. as a partnership in the Christian life and saying it's either or, or uh, free will and predestination. It's always kind of been this sort of mystery of mm-hmm. both and, taking it apart and saying, no, it's either or. Um, all these things that were seen, seen and considered in sort of like a harmonious, mysterious paradox in the life of – Yeah, I'm thinking of – All right. Seth asked the question, do we distinguish between and separate justification and sanctification or are they to stay together? Here's the thing I think we have to do. If our doctrine of, of justification is correct based off the imputed righteousness of Christ, but by faith the righteousness of Christ is imputed to our account. We have to separate them as far as our position before God is concerned, right? In other words, my justification before God can't have anything to do with my um, sanctification. It can't have anything to do with my sanctification because if my sanctification is somehow has anything to do with my justification, then I'm not justified by an imputed righteousness. I'm justified by a righteousness that is infused, and then I work with it in the process of sanctification. And if I get to enough, if I get sanctified enough, then I can declare myself justified. We have to separate it as far as our legal standing before God is concerned. All right? We have to. Now, we could argue that that regeneration, justification, sanctification fit into the overall scheme of salvation, but we cannot merge them together as far as our standing before God is concerned because our sanctification is never, no no one believes 
not even Catholics believe, that our justification will ever be perfect in this life. That's why they have purgatory, because you got to be purged of all the sins that you died with, right? So so no one believes our sanctification. Well, there's maybe some out there who believe, but there, there would be in the minority of the minority of the minority. No one believes our sanctification is ever going to be perfect. Well, if our sanctification is never going to be perfect and we tie it to justification, then our justification will never be perfect. Therefore, no one's going to be saved and we're all going to go to hell or we're going to have to go to purgatory to be purified enough so that we can get to heaven. That's why you have to have purgatory. Right? So if we're going to merge them together, we, we merge them together and, and just in an overall discussion of salvation, but we cannot merge them together as far as our standing, our legal standing before God because that'll be, uh, uh, you know, that, that would be a mess. I, I think justification is our legal standing before God. Sanctification deals with the practical living out of our Christian life, right, which is going to be done imperfectly, right? And we're going to die, and we're going to die in an imperfect state, pos- practically, not positionally. So my sanctification cannot be connected to my justification as far as my position before God is concerned. That's the best way I can under. If we, if we don't, if we, if we, if we merge them together, as far as our standing before God is concerned, then we basically just should just go back to the Catholic Church. And that's, and I think that's what Lordship Salvation does. Lordship Salvation, how do I know I'm justified? I have to look at my sanctification. If my sanctification is good enough, I know I'm justified. That's Catholicism 101. MacArthur should just go back to the Catholic Church. Or Christian Scripture and tradition Scripture and tradition is a great example too. Scripture or tradition. Yeah. It, yeah. It's taking all these things that were sort of these beautiful paradoxical mysteries and saying, no, you have to have one or the other. You can't have both. Um, yeah, the doctrine has to be rationally resolved to the left or, or to the right. Okay, and so I had felt these tensions that we talked about for many, many, many years. And then I read McGrath, and he tells me that this conception I had of justification was brand new. Okay, and this created a an avalanche of questions kind of started pouring down on my head. And they were these. What if the tension that I've been dealing with for all these years, what if it was not the fault of all of those what I considered problematic passages about obedience and the need to persevere and the need to confess sins as a Christian? What if the reason that I was having such a hard time putting all the puzzle pieces together of New Testament theology is that the concept of justification I was working with, which McGrath says was brand new with Luther and Calvin and the Reformers, what if the conception was wrong? After all, if the Reformation view is the biblical view, okay, if the Reformation view is what the Bible actually teaches, how is it that no one in the first 1,500 years of Christian thought ever saw it? Or as McGrath said, even contemplated it. Yeah, I mean, he that's strong it. words. That's right. He yeah. not only says no one ever saw it, he says no one ever even contemplated it in 1,500 years of Christian thought. And, and so I was sitting here thinking, surely if justification as the legal imputation of Christ's righteousness is something clearly taught in the pages of Holy Writ, someone, somewhere, you know, at some point along the way, a millennium and a half? someone would have seen it. And what this led me to is where we stand now in our series. And that is what this led me to to want to do is to re-examine the biblical case then, to look at it again for the Reformation doctrine of justification. You know, you know, kind of, I guess the question I was asking was, how strong could this biblical case be if no one has seen it? No one. And I wanted to begin where virtually every treatment of the subject begins, and that is with our father, Abraham, who had many sons. I am one of them. I, I think you are too. So uh, which arm do we start with first? I thought it was, let's it just the praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm. Yeah. Okay. Turn around, sit down. Okay. Yeah. I want to begin with Abraham. All right. Because Abraham is the father of faith. And Abraham is the central figure in the New Testament that has that is brought out. Now, while they keep emphasizing nobody for 1,500 years ever had the idea, nobody, it was like unheard of. Now, they haven't, they haven't really, they just, they have the the quote from one person. They have a quote from one person, and that one person says, no one did it, and then they read that as an authoritative dogmatic declaration. They don't even, they don't even take that from a pope. They take that supposedly from a Protestant theologian who says no one. Well, I, so I just did a search. 
while they were talking, I just did a search, and then I come up with um, this this article: the history of justification by faith alone up to the Reformation. So they're going to trace the history of justification by faith alone before the Reformation. Now, wait a minute. According to them, nobody even spoke of it until Luther and Calvin. Nobody. And this is how the article begins. The history of the doctrine of justification by faith alone is difficult to trace before the Reformation in the 1500s. A clear line of development of this doctrine from the apostles to Martin Luther simply does not exist. Okay, I don't think anything in church history, there's a clear line that that simply exists. It doesn't. Because I've always said church history is a big ball of yarn. It doesn't like, oh, here's where it started and here's where it ended. It doesn't work that way. Church history, history doesn't work that way. All right? Um, <clears throat> they continue. Now, listen carefully. Listen. This is the, the and again, I, this took three seconds of a Google search. This, this is the exact quote in this article. This does not mean, however, that this doctrine is a modern invention. <clears throat> and then they trace it. Now, I haven't sit here and read all of this article. It's quite long. It's, it's very long. They have, uh, they give all the primary sources. Uh, they have Eusebius. The History of the Christian Church from Christ to Constantine. Um, oh, wait. They, they just quoted from McGrath. Alistair, Alistair McGrath. They quoted from him. And this article quotes from him as well. He wrote a book, A History of the Christian Doctrine of Justification. So, and please note, in their quote of McGrath, they don't give us the page number. I don't think they give us the page number or book so that we could go look it up. So, so they got primary sources, secondary sources. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this article. I'm going to post it in the chat for everyone. I'm going to post it in the chat because they're making this claim, hey, nobody for 1,500 years. And then what I'll do for those listening who are not members of Victory Baptist Church, I will post the link to the Council of Trent, and I will post a link to uh, the history of justification by faith alone. I will post both on the theologycentral.net blog, theologycentral.net blog, so that you have these additional resources. I just hate when a program is like, nobody for 1,500 years ever said that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Do you know how much research you have to do to be able to declare that? You'd have to read everything that was written by everyone that's available to us uh, that was written in the first 1,500 years of Christianity. Do you know how much time that would take? Okay, that's insane. Now, you could say it wasn't a dominant teaching. That may be absolutely true. You may say it was rejected by the majority. That may be true. But to say that no one, absolutely no one, and to say it dogmatically and the best they have to back up that dogmatic assertion is supposedly a quote from a Protestant theologian in which they don't give us a page number or they don't even read the quote in its broader context. That, see, that's the, that's not, that's, that is garbage. That's what that is. That's not research. That's not study. Give me the page now. Give me the chapter in which the person makes this. What's the, what book did it come from? If it came from the book that this article quotes from, it's about the doctrine of justification, the history of the doctrine of justification. So like, uh, yeah. All right. So yeah, I'm, I'm getting very irritated with, uh, with the Catholics. But so here we go. Now we're going to get to, to Father Abraham. Uh, we got 25 minutes. I, I'm ready to, I'm ready for them to show me how this is not in the Bible. Because look, here's the thing. Let's make that very clear. If nobody, all right, now let's make this very clear. If nobody in 1500 years ever discussed the doctrine, then that means they are asserting that it's not anywhere in the Bible. Because if it's in the Bible, then the Apostle Paul talked about the doctrine. So did Paul talk about do doctrine of justification by faith alone? Did Paul seem to imply that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to our account by faith? Did Paul do, if Paul did that, then I'm sorry, one person in the first 1500 years of Christianity did talk about it, All right? So, and I'm assuming if Paul did, then there were Christians somewhere who carried, or at least picked up the same idea. Maybe not in large numbers, but there had to be someone there had to be all right here we go so let's see what they have to say by the apostle paul to teach his doctrine of justification and so I, i'll read quickly from romans chapter 4 where paul writes 
What shall we say about Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. That's the key line. Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as what is due. But to one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. Okay, now the event in Abraham's life that the Apostle Paul is referring to here is an event that occurred in Genesis chapter 15, where where we need to go mentally. As the chapter begins, you will remember Abraham, uh, still Abram at the time. Okay, let's stop right here. So he read in Romans what we've already studied in our study of Romans, all right? And listen carefully. This is very, very, very important. Now, he did not offer any interpretation of that, right? He just read it. Now he's like, oh, and he's referring to Abraham. So he's going to go back to Genesis 15. And I guess what he's going to try to infer is that we all get Genesis 15 wrong. Therefore, we get Romans 4 wrong. So instead of trying to try to take apart what Paul is saying in Romans 4, he's going to go to Genesis 15 and say, that's not what Genesis 15 is teaching because Genesis 15 doesn't teach that. Then we cannot teach, then we cannot teach that in Romans chapter 4. But the words he just read in Romans chapter 4, they seem pretty clear, right? They seem pretty clear. And this is, this is one, of the, the, what is one of the most frustrating things about theological debate is you'll have a scripture that seems like the most obvious, the most clear thing in the world. And you, we can't get, like everyone will like, nope, that's not what it says. That's not what it says. And you're like, that it, it's right there. Nope, 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 nope. And it's like, I, I can understand the verses that you're like, wait, what's going on? I don't understand it. But it's the verses that seem so clear that sometimes we have the most disagreement on. And it's like, do we have a disagreement because the passage isn't clear? Or do we have a disagreement because we're not willing to see what the passage says? We only are willing to see in the text what we already believe. Like that, that's the thing that sometimes bothers me. But let's see what they're going to do here with Genesis 15. All right, here we go. And this is going to count, uh, obviously, for the first hour and the second hour. We're just going to finish this up and it'll be all the teaching instead of stopping And then starting again, I'm just going to carry this through. All right, here we go. And by the way, I'll just call him Abraham for simplicity. Abraham Abraham is struggling with the fact that while God has promised him a son, years have passed and it hasn't happened. God takes Abraham outside and God says to him, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And then the Very important, verse 6. And he, that is Abram, believed the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Okay, now, here's what's important. This verse, Genesis 15, 6, and Paul's references to it later, this is universally understood within classic Protestantism to be describing the moment at which Abraham was justified by faith alone. That is, Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord legally credited the righteousness of Christ to him retroactively since Jesus wasn't going to come for another couple thousand years, okay? In fact, here's how one Reformed theologian describes it, Matt. Genesis 15, 6 states, and he believed in the Lord and he counted to him for righteousness. And then continuing to quote from this Protestant theologian, God grants righteousness to Abraham as a free gift. It is clear that when Abraham was justified by faith, the righteousness which was reckoned or charged to his account was a righteousness not his own, but that of another, namely the righteousness of Christ. Okay, Matt. Now, as I examine... Okay, all right, this, I'm sorry there. I, tar- I thought the mic was on and it wasn't. All right, this irritates me to no end. They quoted McGrath, they, they quoted him 
and they they quoted him because he uh, and they gave us his name because they agreed with his statement. Here they quote from a Protestant uh, a Protestant theologian, a, pro- a Protestant commentary, and they don't give us the name. They don't give us a page number. They don't give us anything. They give us nothing. So we can't even, we can't even verify this source. I can't look at this source. I can't check it. I can't look at exactly like, why not? Get, look, you gave me the name of McGrath. They didn't even give us the full context of McGrath's quote, but they at least gave us his name. A, a Protestant theologian, a Protestant commentary. Well, give me the name of it. Give me the page number. So that I can go look at everything they had to say in regards to this. But what they're getting ready to do is they're getting ready to say that all of our understanding of Genesis 15 is wrong. Now, look, they've got less than 22 minutes to do this. All right. Now, uh, we we may not be able to finish this. I'm going to try. I'm going to try to let them do the talking. If you get if if you have. For those members of Victory Baptist, Baptist Church, when they start making an argument, if you think their argument is right and sounds good or you're confused by it, let me know. But the, I think they're going to give us four reasons why our understanding of Genesis 15 is wrong. All right, so here we go. This key passage, and this is where we begin today. And I began to read for the first time in my life what Catholic apologists had to say about this passage. I came to believe that this is not, and in fact, this cannot be the correct interpretation. That is the interpretation given by this Protestant scholar that I just read. Can't be. This Protestant scholar that I just read that I'm not going to give you his name, and I'm not going to give you the page number. I mean, I can give you the name of the book. Hey, but I, but hey, when, when it's a Protestant scholar that agrees with us, I'm going to give you his name. What? Oh, man. Okay. Okay. Okay, and I'm going to walk through four issues uh, or four points, uh, parts of an argument in favor of what I'm saying. But first is a little bit more contextual. Um, Back to this issue of tension that I mentioned a few moments ago. I want you to notice first that if the Protestant reading of Genesis 15, 6 is correct, the same tension that I described earlier is created in spades throughout the, the narrative of Abraham's life. Okay, if their interpretation is correct. Because imagine that in Genesis 15, 6, imagine that this passage is recording the moment when God legally credited or imputed the righteousness of Christ to Abraham's account, and he was justified by faith alone. Basically, when Abraham got saved. This is when Abraham got saved. Yeah. When it was a done deal. prayer, right? And he trusted Jesus, and it's all good from there. Yeah. Okay. So imagine that that's the correct interpretation. Then how do we understand um, Genesis 17, two chapters later, where God commands Abraham to receive the sign of circumcision and warns him that if he doesn't obey, he will be cut off from the covenant. I am God Almighty. I'm reading from it now. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you. Any uncircumcised male shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Um, how were we to understand Genesis 22? Another- Stop right there. Okay. Now, according to him, in Genesis 15, so now this is what he's doing. So he's not going to give us a positive interpretation of the passage. What he's going to simply do is like, here's their interpretation and their interpretation cannot be right. We're not going to tell you what it means. We're not going to offer an interpretation yet. We're just going to criticize the other. Okay, that's always, that's okay. But all right, but maybe, maybe they're going to get to the positive interpretation yet. Okay, so let's go with this, all right? Let's go with this idea. Now, because they're they're going to go ahead and they're going to go through this quickly. So we're, we're going to have to slow it down a little bit. All right, so I'm going to ask you the question. In Genesis 15, if Abraham is declared righteous, boom, then is it inconsistent with that in Genesis 17? For God to say, hey, Abraham, do you have to get circumcised and anyone who doesn't get circumcised, they're going to be cut off from among the people. Is that, is that, is that inconsistent? Is that, does that destroy the interpretation in Genesis 15? 
Now, I will argue Genesis 15 is Abraham standing before God. He's declared righteous. He's, he stands before God. And we're going to see Abraham in the, in, in the narrative. He's going to mess up. He's going to do things that are wrong. He's going to demonstrate at times a lack of faith. He's going to demonstrate, uh, you know, uh, lying, uh, lying. He's going to do a lot of things that are not a, a good thing. And God doesn't hold that against him. Why? Because he's declared righteous, right? Okay, I think I think there's at least a, 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 like we can make the argument there as well that there are other things that happen that seem consistent with that interpretation. So how do we deal with this? Well, God's going to make a covenant. A covenant's going to be based on Abraham's descendants, and this is going to be a covenant for the nation and how the nation is to operate. And you're not, and you have to have the sign of circumcision. If you don't, you're cut off among the people. Does that have anything to do with their standing before God as far as salvation is concerned, or does this have to do with how the nation is going to operate and how people are going to be a part of the covenant or not part of the covenant? I I, I don't know if there's I don't know if there's a clear. I don't know how that completely destroys Genesis 15. I I don't know. And even if you say it destroys Genesis 15, then then was Paul misunderstanding it? Then the next one they go to is Genesis 22. We'll let them articulate this. Genesis 22. All right, we'll, 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 we'll continue playing. Here we go. Another five chapters later where Abraham is commanded to sacrifice his son Isaac on Mount Moriah. And when Abraham follows through, the Lord says to him, quoting again, because you have done this and have not withhold your son, your only son, I will indeed bless your descendants because you have obeyed my voice. And how are we to understand Genesis 26 where the. Oh, whoa. Now they got to slow. No, they got to slow down here. Wait a minute. If all he says is, I'm going to bless your descendants because of what you did, he didn't say, hey, Abraham, because you offered up your son, now you're accepted before me. Now you're saying, no, he doesn't say that. Like you, you, if, if what you're saying is in Genesis 22 because of Abraham's action, now somehow he's justified. God doesn't say that. He says, he's going to bless your descendants because of what you did. That has nothing to do with Abraham standing before God. So how does that disprove it? How does Genesis 22 disprove it? I, I don't even understand that. Um, because, because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, that, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven. How does that, that's, that's a blessing that comes from obedience. How does that destroy the doctrine of imputation? If I obey God, there's a blessing. If I disobey God, there's negative consequences. Does that not remain true even with the doctrine of imputation? Because that deals with my practical standing, not my position before God. He doesn't say, hey, Abraham, because you offered your son, now you're righteous. Now I will declare you righteous. Now you are righteous. No, he doesn't. Because I, How does that even, like, how is that even an argument? How is that even an argument? Like, you got to come up with better arguments than this. Okay, that, that's weak. That one is, that's really weak. Okay, we'll go to the next one. And listen, everyone knows, look, if you offer a good argument, I will sit there and struggle with it all day long. And if I need to change my doctrine, I'll change my doctrine. But that, that, one, that one doesn't even, that one wasn't even worth mentioning. That was an absolute waste of time to even mention it. All right, let's see if they've got to, the next one's got to be the, they've got to have one of these that's going to be the home run. One of these has to knock it out. Like, like so far, they have not given us anything to even come close to destroying our interpretation, right? They may pose some, and, and please note, for every doctrine, you can always find verses that are difficult. For the Catholic teaching, right, of, of their teaching of salvation, what of all the verses in the New Testament about, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That seems pretty straightforward. That goes against the Catholic teaching. Like, so for every doctrine, there's always verses that raises difficulties, but they've got to have a home run here. They've got to have a home run verse here. They've got to have one. So let's see, here we go. Lord repeats the promises of the covenant to Isaac and says to him, Quoting again, I will fulfill the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Notice the text doesn't say, I will fulfill the oath that I swore to Abraham because he believed me and the, my righteousness was credited to his account at that time. It says, because 
The righteousness has to do with his standing before God. These are verses talking about, I'm going to do this in your in, in, in life. I'm going to carry out this promise or this promise because of obedience. The one thing the Bible clearly makes throughout the Bible is obedience leads to blessing. Disobedience leads to a curse. That is true. But that has nothing to do with my standing before God. So he's taking verses that are talking about what God is going to do in their practical life. Like he's going to carry out this promise or not carry, he's going to withhold this blessing or give this blessing based on what they did. And they're trying to apply that to what we understand as a verse that talks about my imputed righteousness before God. They're, they're, they're conflating the two. They're, 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 I don't even know what they're doing. They, 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 like they either don't understand the Protestant teaching or they're completely misrepresenting the Protestant teaching to try to make an argument against it. Because he obeyed. So once again, we have this radical, if the Protestant interpretation of Genesis 15, 6 is, is the correct interpretation, then we have this radical tension where God is saying to him, you have got it. You believed and it was credited to you. And then start saying, oh, by the way, if you don't do this, you lose it. And if you don't do that, you lose it. And oh, because you did this, you've got it. And, and, and even to Isaac, his son, you know, I will confirm the oath that I swore to Abraham because Abraham obeyed my commandments. So you see, the tension is there. And that's the first point that I want to make. Well, it's so funny to me to hear a reformed person talk about how this all functioned in their brain. Because again, these were not issues that I had as a Wesleyan Arminian Christian. You know, when I hear that God says that you have to believe him in order to get blessing and you have to obey him in order to get blessing, I don't feel like he's talking about two different things. Like right, there's, right. it's all supposed to be meant to be part of this package deal where you believe God, you trust his commandments, you continue to believe, but that doesn't let you off the hook for obedience. So when I hear, as it says in Genesis 26, it says, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments and my statutes mm-hmm. and my laws, I don't see that as a phrase that's contradictory to because Abraham believed. I just think that's all part of the same package. That's kind of the, well, that's, that shows but, you how see, the tension the tension doesn't exist between faith and obedience once you believe that salvation is a a, a path that has to be walked right. and persevered until the end. Right, as it was taught to me in, in, in yeah. my particular— Then there's no issue. Okay, now here now okay, now they're getting to the crux of the matter. Salvation is a path you have to walk and you have to persevere to the end. Okay, but here's the thing. I'm going to sin all day long on that path. I'm going to sin. I'm going to commit venial sins. I'm going to commit mortal sins. I'm going to commit sins that are not even in the venial or mortal category. I'm going to create new categories. I'm going to disobey. I'm not going to love God with all my heart, mind, body, and soul. I'm not going to love my neighbor as myself. I'm not going to love the things of God uh, above all things else. I'm not going to seek first the kingdom of God. I'm, I'm going to violate this, violate this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to have these thoughts, wrong motivation, sin, 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 sin. So if I'm going to continually sin, then how am I ever going to persevere to the end when I'm sinning all the time? Either I have to redefine what sin is, and I will give you just one scripture, be ye holy as I am holy, which none of us will ever do. So that means I'm living in a perpetual state of sin. So if my salvation has anything to do with my keeping the law and obeying, I'm going to go to hell. Why can they not figure that out? We're not the ones confused. We are, yes, we're called to obey. Yes, we should obey. If we don't obey, it's called sin. But my position before God is based on something other than my obedience. Because if my position for, for before God is dependent upon my obedience, I'm going to go to hell. I don't understand how that's complicated. They have to like, like they have to just play down. And, and it's like this whole thing, like they're like, well, I don't know how those Protestants just, you know, they just act like you just believe God and just do whatever you want. Yeah. And Catholics don't act like you just believe God and do whatever you want. Give me a break. All right. You know, Catholics act like just do whatever I want. Go to confession. Okay. They, they don't even, the, the average Catholic doesn't even seem to be remotely concerned that they're going to end up in hell. They don't even seem remotely concerned that they're going to end up in purgatory. When Luther understood the Catholic system, he was terrified. He lived in a perpetual state of fear that he was going to die and go to hell. He didn't think he would ever be good enough for God. All right, why? Because he realized there's no way. So do you, you, you just have to either pretend that you're God, more godly than you are, but you're not. You're just as ungodly as I am, and I'm just as ungodly as you are. We're all ungodly. So we got to have a better system then. Okay, persevere to the end. 
Just keep doing good. Keep doing good. I got to keep doing good. Well, at that point, I am going to sell everything I have and go live in a monastery, rip out my eyes, cut off my hands, cut off my feet, and then I have hopefully a chance to get to heaven. May, and even then, I'm, I'm probably going to have to then just ask them to, actually what I'll do is just actually confess my sin and then shoot myself where I can just immediately go to heaven because even if I cut off my hands, pluck out my eyes, I still have a brain that's still probably going to think sinful thoughts. So at best, just kill yourself as fast as you can to get to heaven. Yeah, this, 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 I, this is crazy. All right, here we go. Form of but if you view salvation yeah. as something that actually takes place at the beginning and is, in its most important sense, completed at the beginning, then all these ideas have to be explained. Then you have to have a really complicated way yeah. to, to talk about Genesis 26 beyond what the text itself actually says, which is... No, I don't have to have a complicated way to talk about it. Let me make it very simple. Abraham's position before God was settled because of the imputed righteousness that God gave him because of his faith. And all the other passages that speak of blessing that comes from obedience is the blessing that God gives for obeying. And if I fail to obey, I may face temporal setbacks, chastisement, or the temporal uh, ramifications of going against God's law. Okay, all of that plays out, but it does not impact my perfect standing before God because that was by faith. How is that complicated? Or, or, or like I say, you go beyond what the text says all All of a sudden, the Catholic Church is worried about going beyond what the text says. Whoa, yeah, man, that never happens in Catholic theology. They never go beyond what the text says. They are so worried about the text that they base everything on Scripture alone. You don't even base it on what's on Scripture alone. So what are you talking about that we're going beyond the text? That's ridiculous. All right, here we go. Abraham obeyed, and he was kept blessed laws, because of that. My... Okay, second point, though, and here's where I really began to present my argument against the Protestant interpretation. The last point was more of just kind of reminding myself and you and everyone of how this tension that I've described in the New Testament can be seen in Abraham's life as well. Okay, here's my, here's my second point. When you read Genesis 15, 6, you can see just reading the words, the passage isn't even saying that righteousness was somehow credited or transferred or imputed to Abraham. It's not even saying that. What the passage actually says is, and I quote it again, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. That is, Abraham believed God and it, that is his faith. Abraham's faith was reckoned as righteousness. It's not even saying Abraham believed God and God reckoned righteousness. It's saying Abraham believed God and that, his faith, was reckoned as righteousness. Now, the word translated reckoned here, it doesn't imply, certainly doesn't necessarily imply, anything being legally credited or anything like that. The word means to reckon, to count, to consider. And you know, when I say, I reckon Matt Swain to be a good guy, or I, you know, I count Matt Swain to be a good guy, or you know what? I impute goodness to uh, Matt Swain. I've never said it exactly like that. It'd be kind of It's a shame you haven't really. Okay. But the word means to consider too. If I say, I reckon Matt to be a good guy, I consider, I, all I mean is I consider him to be a good guy. I don't mean, um, I don't mean that I have taken goodness and legally credited to, to to an account that Matt has somewhere. You know what I mean? If only you, know? you would, Ken. You know, I reckon I'd be better off. Yeah. It, it, okay. God looks at Abraham's faith and he reckons. He counts. He considers it as righteousness. Okay. The, the most, na- what I'm saying is the most natural reading of the actual words of Genesis 15, 6 is to say that Abraham believed God's promise and God counted him. God reckoned him, God considered him to be a righteous man, okay? In other words, in the end, I believe. Does anyone understand their argument here? Abraham believed and God counted him righteous. So he didn't impute him righteousness. He just considered him righteous. Well, if he just considered him righteous, then did he, was his consideration right or was his consideration wrong? And if he considered him righteous just because of his faith, 
then faith would be the basis of me being considered righteous before God. I'd be considered righteous before God because of faith alone. In other words, they're focusing that it is the faith. So he believed, and because he believed he was counted righteous as he was considered righteous, well, then he was considered righteous by faith alone, not by what he does. So I, I'm. does anybody, like they're, they're, they're trying to argue that this, I, I'm not getting it. I'm not understanding the argument. The, the, I'll see. Does it, if any, does anyone, can anyone articulate their argument? We've got to finish here really quick. If any, if, if I, okay, thank, thank you, Seth. Yeah, it sounds like he's trying to make our argument. That, that's what it, that, I agree. I, it sounds like he's trying to make our argument. I, I don't understand. Hey, you know why they're wrong? They're wrong because the text says Abraham believed and God counted him righteous, which, which, doesn't mean that he gave him righteousness. It just means he, he considered him righteous. So it's, it's not, it's not, it doesn't mean, it, this sounds like someone trying to argue against something and their argument is so weak, they can't even make an, are like, I don't even understand this argument. And, and here's the thing, even if what they're saying is true, how did Abraham, how did Paul understand it? How did Paul, under, was Paul wrong? Because Paul seems to really be driving on the point that he was imputed righteousness. It seems he seems to really be driving that point home. Right. It's just a weird. Let's continue. I believe that Genesis fifteen six is basically saying the same thing that Nehemiah nine verses seven and eight say about Abraham. In other words, and listen to this because it's I think it's very instructive. Nehemiah nine verses seven and eight we read, "You are the Lord, the God who chose Abram." And brought him out of Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name Abraham. And you found his heart faithful before you. And you made a covenant to give his descendants the land. Okay? God found his heart to be faithful. In Genesis 6, just to give you a parallel. In Genesis 6, we read this. We read, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And, and why? Well, we're told. Because Noah was a righteous man blameless in his generation, or because Noah walked with God. So Noah was a righteous man. Uh, he was blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and therefore God fa- Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. It does, this mean mean, that, does this mean that Noah believed and was justified, or does it mean that Noah obeyed God? Or does it just mean all of the above? It, it means all of the above. But, but the thing that I have in my mind that I want to communicate is, when you read this, it doesn't mean that Noah was perfectly righteous. I mean, no one reads this and thinks, oh, this, th- this passage, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. This doesn't mean he was a sinless human being walking about the earth, you know, traipsing about. Um, and it doesn't mean that he had righteousness, perfect righteousness, legally credited to his account. It's just a way of saying Noah was a man of God. Noah was faithful to the Lord. In, in fact, we could go on, but it would take us off track. There are many, many, many times in the Old Testament. So what Genesis 15, 6 is saying is that, hey, Abraham was faithful to God. A- Abraham, was, Abraham was faithful to God, so he was righteous. Not that God, con- God considered him righteous because Abraham was righteous, but it wasn't perfect righteousness. So he wasn't perfectly righteous, but he was righteous. So was he right? I don't, I'm, I'm so confused. So was Abraham righteous or not righteous? Because clearly he's not perfectly righteous because he's going to do a lot of things wrong. So I'm still confused here. So Abraham was righteous. Abraham was righteous. Was he not righteous? Was he kind of righteous? Was he considered righteous, but he wasn't righteous? Well, what, 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 what was he, right? What, I, I don't understand. And if he wasn't righteous, then why was God considering him righteous? If he wasn't perfectly righteous, well, why was God considering him righteous? Was he not considering him righteous? Was this just God saying, hey, Abraham's faithful, but Abraham's not going to always remain faithful. He's, he's going to have his problems. I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't even understand what they're trying to tell me here. Like, I, like, they're talking about us making it complicated. I'm so confused here now. I don't even know, understand. And what was Paul talking about? If, if, why would Paul use this argument that we're not justified, we're ju- not justified by works and make a reference to Abraham if all God was saying was, hey, he was a faithful guy because if he was a faithful guy and that's why he was considered righteousness, then Paul would have to say, you are not justified by works. However, if you're not faithful, you're not justified. Like I'm, I don't under, how, 
I, I don't understand Paul's argument. It's interesting he's not going to, to the New Testament and, and destroying Paul's argument here. He's just trying to go to Genesis 15, 6 and say, we've got it all wrong. But he, he's yet to let me even know what it means. When God's people are referred to as righteous, you know, if, if someone is just a faithful son of the covenant, he can be described that way. So it doesn't mean Noah was perfect. It doesn't mean he had righteousness credited to his count. And, and the same thing with Abraham here. When God sees his faith and reckons righteousness to him, it doesn't mean that he's perfect, and it doesn't mean that perfection was credited to him. It just means Abraham found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Okay? So, now here's the third point, and this is kind of, this is maybe the most interesting, maybe not. It's certainly the grossest. (laughs) It's certainly the grossest, yeah. Okay, here's my third point. There's another passage in the Old Testament that I think argues very strongly that the interpretation of Genesis 15, 6 that I've given here is on the right track, okay? In Numbers chapter 25, not exactly a passage you read to your kids at bedtime, okay? Oh, but you should, Ken. Uh, Anything for the book of Numbers, is it's it's, uh, tell it around the campfire. That's all I'm saying. Okay, we read about an interesting event. Not many will recognize immediately that it's from Numbers 25, but you'll probably remember the story. The Israelites are crossing through the land of the Moabites on their way to the land of Canaan, the land of, land of promise. Some of the men, the Israelite men, begin to sin with the women of the area, commit fornication. God sends a plague among them. And while Moses is on his face before the tent of meeting, weeping and crying out to God, an Israelite man has the audacity to take a Midianite woman in the presence of everyone into his tent. Okay. At this point, we read, Phineas, the son of Eliezer, son of Aaron, the priest, saw it. He rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the inner room and pierced them both through. The man of Israel and the woman through her body. Thus, the plague was stayed from the people of Israel. All right. It might sound like a better shot than it was. They were both very close together when he threw the spear. Yes. Yes. And I'm sure you're asking, what in the world? (laughs) Right. No. No. (laughs) What in the world does this have to do with justification by faith alone? That's the question. What in the world? Phineas spearing a man and a woman, pinning them to the ground. What does that have to do with justification? Well, this is what it has to do, okay? In Psalm 106, in the 106th Psalm, verses 28 through 31, this same event is recalled. And I want you to listen very carefully to what is said about this gentleman, Phineas. This is from Psalm 106. The Israelites attached themselves to the Baal of Peor, that is one of the false gods of the Moabites, ate sacrifice, eight sacrifices offered to the dead, committed fornication, They provoked the Lord to anger with their doings, and a plague broke out among them. Then Phineas stood up and interposed. Very nice way of saying it. And the plague was stayed. And here it is. And that has been reckoned to him as righteousness from generation to generation forever. Okay? That has been reckoned to him as righteousness from generation to generation forever. Here's the thing I want to communicate. Apart from Genesis 15, 6, Matt, and apart from Paul's references to this passage in the the New Testament, this happens to be the only place in the entire Bible where we find those words, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. In Genesis chapter... Okay, now this, this is an interesting argument. Okay, now this one has my... For a minute, I was getting ready to interrupt and go, what are they doing? Where are they going? This is interesting. So, Psalm 106, 31. Now, please note, they're still not going to how Paul handles it. Now, I've got, I cannot stress this enough. No matter, so, so first of all, they're going to Psalm 106, 31, uh, Psalm 106, 31, and they're using that to then tend to go back and say, well, then what, how we interpret Abraham is that then Abraham was counted righteousness for what he did, because obvious Phineas here executes judgment so that the plague was stayed. And because he did this, that was counted unto him for righteousness unto all generations forevermore. 
So that was counted for him. That was accredited him as a righteous thing. All right. So in other words, they're saying then we are accredited righteousness by our actions. That is what they're making an argument. Now, please note, and, and this is Paul's argument in, in Romans, is Paul, as Abraham was accounted righteousness before his actions. He was accounted righteousness before circumcision. He was accounted righteousness, be, accounted righteous before he offered up his son. So that so that's why Paul uses uses that text. So how do we understand this action? <clears throat> my, um, my this is just the top of my head. The only way we can understand the Psalm passage is this: what Phineas did could be seen as an evil or horrible thing because he killed two people with a spear. Seems horrible. Seems horrible. And what the Bible is saying is that act was counted as a righteous act by God. All right. So that th- this is not talking anything about salvation. It's just saying, hey, when we read about this horrible act that we may want to condemn and we want to say evil, God counts it as a righteous act, that it's righteous because uh, he was doing the right thing or that God deemed it to be the right thing. Right? So I don't, but that Paul and his teaching on the doctrine of justification does not mention this. So either Paul needed to, to bring in Psalm 106 in, in the book of Romans, but for some reason he doesn't bring this up. Why not? Because clearly this cannot be referring to the same thing that Genesis 15, 6 is referring to, because in Paul's teaching on justification, he refers to Genesis 15 and not Psalm 106. All right. I think that would have to be the best I can come up with. All right. We've only got a few minutes left. 15, Abraham believes God and it is reckoned to him as righteousness. Here in Psalm 106, Phineas runs his spear through a man and a woman and it is reckoned to him as righteousness. And, and here's the question I have for those who insist that Genesis 15 is teaching justification by the imputation of, righteous, of Christ's righteous by faith alone. Here's the question. What is Psalm 106 teaching? Justification by execution alone? Truly, I mean, it's funny to say it, but truly, I wonder if there's a single Protestant theologian on earth who believes that when Phineas ran into that tent with his spear and nailed the man and the woman to the ground and killed them both, executed them both, I wonder if there's any theologian on earth, in fact, who believes that when this occurred, God legally credited to Phineas, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. All I see is Phineas, in his righteous anger, basically said, this is no longer acceptable in the land of Israel. Okay, now, again, he's not being fair here because Genesis 15, we have the commentary of Genesis 15 in the book of Romans. So Paul, we have to go to how Paul is interpreting Genesis 15. Paul doesn't mention Psalm 106. So clearly, Paul doesn't think Psalm 106 has anything to do with his teaching on the doctrine of justification. So we got to deal with how Paul deals with Genesis 15. There is your how to interpret Genesis 15. So I, I uh, oh, okay, here we go. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of the same thing as you were saying with Noah and with Abraham. Um, you know, what, what if this is just a way of saying, as it appears to be in so many other cases in the Old Testament, that this is a person who loved God and was mm-hmm. willing to obey God and live righteously in the sight of God, uh, rather than having some sort of like an imputed transaction that took place in that moment. Yeah, some transfer of righteousness from his from God's account to his or something like that. You know, in fact, I think that the words in there, I'm not going to go on and on about this, but the words from generation to generation kind of prove that the interpretation you're giving is the true one. Because what Psalm 106 is clearly saying is that because of what Phineas did in his zeal for God, he is remembered. You know, he's reckoned, he's considered, he's remembered, if you will, from generation to generation as having been a righteous man. In in other words, that phrase from generation to generation doesn't make any sense if you interpret it to mean some kind of a legal crediting, you know? He was legally credited from generation to generation. No, I mean, it's clearly saying because of what he did, He's remembered, he's considered, he's reckoned, he's counted. He's considered to have been a righteous man from generation to generation. Everyone in the, among the people of Israel always knows now forever to think of this man as having been a righteous man. That's what it's saying. 
And I think that's what Genesis 15, 6 is saying as well. Abraham believed God and it, his faith, was reckoned, considered as righteousness. In other words, it's not saying anything about righteousness being transferred to him. Now, there's one more reason I have for believing what I'm saying here, okay? That Genesis 15, 6 cannot be describing some moment in which Abraham believes and God reckons or credits righteousness to his account. And it's this. And this is one, I don't see any way of getting around this at all. At the time the events recorded in Genesis 15 occurred, that is the time in Abraham's life, Abraham had already been walking in the steps of faith for a quarter of a century. He had been a believer for decades. Now, remember, according to the Reformation concept, we are justified the moment we first believe. The moment we first look to Christ in faith and reach out our hand, we are justified. So why wasn't Abraham justified back in Genesis 12 is the question that comes to me. When God first called him and said to him, go forth from your land and your father's house to a land that I will show you. And we read that Abraham left everything behind and obeyed God and went. Or why wasn't Abraham justified during the 25 year span in which he is sojourning about the land of Canaan, building altars to the Lord, offering sacrifices to the Lord. Nearly his own son. Why isn't that the mark of his justification? Yeah, meeting with meeting with the Lord and talking face to face about Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, like, why wasn't he justified then? Are we saying that all this occurred before Abraham truly believed? You know, back to the college analogy, you know, you know, um, yeah, you went to school and you went uh, and you did uh, your lessons and you took the tests and all that kind of thing. Um, but you weren't justified because you didn't truly believe at that point or something. Why does God put Abraham to the test by having his son walk up that mountain if Abraham had already? Seal the deal back when he looked up at the stars. Unless yeah, well, it's an, unless it's a process. Yeah. Unless yeah, it's a process, which is bringing up the issue of, of, of the tensions again. Why? Why is there this test, which apparently he could fail because the angel of the Lord comes to him when he doesn't fail and says, "Because you have done this and offered your, been willing to sacrifice your son, therefore I will bless you." Yeah, and the and the. And the condition of circumcision, all of that. Okay. So, but the point is, Abraham, at the time this occurs in Genesis 15, 6, Abraham has been walking in the steps of faith for 25 years. So, how can this passage in Genesis 15? Let me help their confusion. Here's how when God says, I declare that you to be righteous, then God determines the time. We don't determine the time. God determines the time. If that's the point God says here, you believed and I declare you righteous, and this is the point he announces it, then that's that's where it is. And th- and Paul picks up this event to teach his doctrine of justification. I don't well, for 25 years, he walked. And well, for 25 years, God didn't just say, you believed and I accounted it to you for righteousness. God didn't say it for 25 years. I don't know why. Ask God. But Paul, under the under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and his handling this text, he uses that event to teach his doctrine of justification. So why did Paul think that this was significant? Paul thought that this event was so significant that he used it as one of his fundamental arguments for believing that we are justified by faith and not according to works. Why did Paul think this was significant? Because God obviously believed at this point something significant had happened. I don't know why it looked like for 25 years. I I can't speak to that. I have no, well, for 25 years, he seemed, I don't know, for 25 years, he did a lot of things. For 25 years, he didn't always, when he, when he was told to leave the land, he was told to leave everyone behind and he carried Lot with him. So he didn't do everything perfectly. And he didn't do everything perfectly after. So I, I don't like, okay, we're almost done. He be referring to the moment in which he first believed and was credited with righteousness in the in the Reformation sense. Okay, in conclusion, let me kind of wrap this up. What I would submit is that in the light of these four considerations, the tensions created in Abraham's life, the actual wording of the passage that we've looked at, the parallel with Psalm 106 and our good friend Phineas, and now the timing of the event 
in Genesis 15, 6. I don't think this passage can be teaching what Protestantism takes it to be teaching. All of that is simply read into the passage, is what I would submit. The whole idea of legal transfer of righteousness is something that is literally being read into the passage. It's not there. And again, let's just look at how life works in general with common sense, Ken. You and I are going to stop this episode and go on to our daily lives, and we have to be fathers and husbands and such. And we can't just say, well, you know, my relationship with my wife was, you know, reckoned to me as marriage in that moment when we (laughs) stood before the altar. Therefore, all my sins are forgiven past, present, and future in that moment. And I can do anything I want to because everybody knows that, you know, my heart was given to her back then. You know, no, I got to live it today, man. I got to live that today. Same. Hey, man, you got to live it today, man. Yeah, live it today, man. You're not going to live it right, man. So what does that leave you, man? What are they going to do, man? I mean, his his condescending attitude here gets on my my stinking nerves is what this starts to do. It starts making me angry. Okay, man, you just go do what you want to do, man. No, hey, man, you're going to go you're going to go be a husband and you're not going to be the right kind of husband. You're going to be a father. You're not going to be the right kind of father. You're going to fail and 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 you're going to fail. So why do you think you're going to stand right before a holy God? You're never going to do enough. You're never going to do it good enough. In fact, I would say some of your condescending attitude demonstrates an unrighteous heart, just like my anger right now probably demonstrates an unrighteous heart because we're all unrighteous. So you want to talk about reality. The reality is you're going to never live up to God's standard. So why do you think you're going to be standing before a holy God? That's why you have to go to confession over and over. You need penance, penance you need indulgences, and you need purgatory. That's the system that doesn't make any sense. So then what was the point of Jesus on the cross? What what did Jesus do on the cross? All he did was make us save a bull. He did not save anyone. Jesus didn't save me. He just made me savable. And now, now that he made me savable, the way I fi- I have to finish the deal. I have to do it. He basically got me out of jail, gave me probation, and now I've got to finish the deal with what I do. But I'm never going to finish the deal with what I do because I'm never going to be good enough. Man, so disingenuous. Just look, don't try to argue this, that our interpretation, or just say this is what the Catholic Church declares, right? Don't even, when they try to get biblical, it's now the best they did that Psalm 106 is a great passage to bring up. It's great, but they didn't even deal with the fact that Paul doesn't mention it. Why doesn't Paul mention it? Because clearly the interpretation of Psalm 106 is not, has nothing to do with the interpretation of Genesis 15, 6 and the way in which Paul is using it. How about do some basic Bible study 101? Yeah, that we're going to look at Genesis 15, 6 and we're never even going to deal with how Paul handled it. Like that's, that's not even, that's, that's such poor. The commentary of Genesis 15, 6 is the book of Romans. Read the inspired commentary. Stop reading the Protestant commentary. Read the inspired commentary. Same thing with being a dad. Same thing with being a friend. Same thing with being a coworker. Same thing with everything else in every aspect of our lives. Um, and, and as I was saying before and saying to you before this program, maybe God makes it work that way in every single area of our life as a way mm-hmm. of showing us how he operates with you and I. That's the most ridiculous thing. If, if my relationship with God works like it does in every area of my life, then, then, then it's not by grace because in every area of my life, it's not by grace. It's not by mercy. If I do certain things, some people may forgive me. They may get upset. I may destroy relationships because of my actions. If my relationship with God works just like it does in every other relationship, then it's not by grace. It's not by mercy because my relationship with everyone else doesn't depend on the eternal son of God taking on human flesh and hanging on a cross as a sacrifice for my sin. No, I have a relationship with people and yes, I've got to do certain good things because if I don't do good things, then they're going to get mad at me and then the relationship's going to be broken and they've got to do good things and we've all got to try to do the right thing and we got to say the right thing and say we're sorry and we got to do, all, do, do, do to try to maintain those relationships. Guess what? Those relationships don't have the eternal son of God who died for me. Now, I will argue my relationships with other people have to be lived out based off my relationship with God, which is by grace alone through faith alone. So therefore, how do I handle other people? I'm supposed to love even my enemy. 
and forgive them as Christ Jesus hath forgiven me. So like to try to compare my relationship with God based on how we conduct our relationship in the real world is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Like that's, that's like, I guess Jesus did nothing. Jesus, Jesus wasted his time. I don't know. We even know why Jesus died on the cross at this point. I don't even know why, because it's, it's pretty much, it, he didn't save me. I can tell you that much. All right. Let, let, man, this, this, whoo, th- this is the kind of stuff that will lead someone away from Catholicism. I can tell you that. All right, here we go. They're definitely not leading people home. This is driving people far away from their house. In matters of salvation. Um, because and God is why, one. Yeah, and that's why Paul can so easily slip into the analogy of sowing the field, you know, he who sows to the flesh. And he's writing this to Christians in Galatia. You sow to the flesh, then you'll reap corruption. It's only if you sow to the Spirit by persevering and doing good, he says, that you will, you will uh, harvest, you will reap the harvest of eternal life. Why would Jesus okay. himself use so many agricultural analogies if he wasn't trying to tell us, look at the way that the grass of the field grows and the fruits grow on the vine. That's kind of how it is with you and me. Well, look at the way I've, yeah, the, look at the way I've created the whole world. Yeah. We looked at this passage this week and I, I was planning on bringing in other things, but this passage is the central passage in the Old Testament that is looked at. And I wanted to just examine it and say, is it possible that this passage is actually teaching what the Reformation view says. And I don't think it is. What we're going to do in our next episode, just quickly, Matt, is we're going to look at... There you have it. There is their argument against Genesis 15, 6. Pathetic. We, they have one good argument, and that's the Psalm passage. That's the best they have. And I will give them credit for bringing that up because I, I probably would not even think about that passage. I would have to look at that. Is that counted the same Hebrew word as in Genesis 15, 6? I'm assuming that it is. I'm assuming that it is. If it's a different Hebrew word, then that would be interesting. But I, I think that's a, a that I, I'm I'm glad they brought that up. That's the that's the beauty of doing these kinds of things. You got to listen to the counter argument because they sometimes will bring up things that we don't consider. And we never ra- rarely consider that passage when we talk about justification, and we probably need to do a better job of at least explaining it so that we're not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. So I thank them for that. But they're basically saying, hey, your, your relationship with God is dependent upon what you do, your faithfulness, your faithfulness. And if, if you don't have enough faithfulness, then you're in trouble. You're in trouble. So, so basically believe in God and then you've got to do a lot of good things and maybe, maybe you'll be justified or maybe, maybe you will not. Well, I, I'm sorry. Um, my justification is God, cannot be based on me. It cannot like any rational person who looks at all of the commands in Scripture, don't look at a woman with lust. Boom. If you do that, you commit adultery. If you're angry with someone without a cause, you've committed murder. Well, people are there, there are millions of Christians walking around who are murderers and adulterers. Uh, uh, God hates lying lips. Uh, pride. God hates pride. Uh, uh, go on and on and on and on and on. You're supposed to love God above everything else. Scripture after Scripture condemns me, condemns me, condemns me, condemns me, condemns me, condemns me. Condemns me. The only hope is that Jesus died for, to, for, for a reason. He died because I cannot save myself, that I'm hopeless, I'm helpless. Like if I, I don't understand the Catholic idea that we can somehow pull it off. I mean, I've worked with Catholics. They're not pulling it off. Look at the Catholic Church and all the scandals. They're not pulling it off. Their priests are not pulling it off. What, 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 what's going on? But I, I guess somehow they all want to go to bed at night thinking they're going to go to heaven. I don't know how they can believe they're going to, They're hoping they get to purgatory. Lord, please help me get to purgatory. Please help me get to purgatory, please. And with, with Jesus, let, 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 here's what's crazy. With God, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, with Mary, with all the sacraments, with all the saints, they still can't even hope to get to heaven. They're, oh, they're, their best hope is purgatory. Even with all of the things that they have, at, at their, they've got indulgences, They've got they've got the doctrine of penance. They've got the, they've got the uh, the the, the uh, sacrament of last rites. They've got all of these things, and they they're still their only hope is purgatory. Man, their system can't even their system isn't even enough to get them there. It's just that's just so that's so ridiculous. That's so ridiculous. All right, we'll stop right there. Um, all the Catholics who are now mad at me, you can email me at newsif at yahoo.com. 
newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. I will then not read your email and I will forward it to someone in my church so that they can argue with you. All right. <laughs> okay. So there you have it. I, I, yeah, I don't even know what to say. That's wow. There you go. But, uh, but I think now what you see is the difference between Catholicism and Protestantism is not Mary. It's not robes. It's not incense. It's not chanting. It's not even baptism. It's not the Lord's Supper. Those are not the things that separate us. The things that separate us is right here, the very doctrine of justification. How is a person saved? They don't believe what we believe. They have a different gospel. And if they have a different gospel, it's either their gospel is right or our gospel is right or both of ours is wrong, but they both cannot be right. They both cannot be right. And I will argue that the gospel that they, they proclaim is another gospel, which isn't another gospel. It's a false gospel. And according to the Apostle Paul, it's anathema. And you can't get mad at me for saying that because the Catholic Church at the Council of Trent issued an anathema upon the doctrine of justification by faith alone. So, they, they anathematized us. I believe scripture anathematized them. That is the difference between it. And now you heard it from the lips of Catholics, not from a non-Catholic trying to condemn the Catholic church. You listen to them just really do a horrible job of trying to even explain how a person gets saved. And I'm telling you, if you go through their entire system, it's the most convoluted, complicated mess you've ever seen. It requires a flow chart to even figure out if you're saved or if you're even in a state of grace or if you've lost a state of grace, well, how many penance, what penance do you need to do? Do you need, do you need an indulgence? How do you get the indulgence? Yeah, it's a never-ending system of never knowing if you're saved. And uh, so that means I don't know what Jesus actually did on the cross. So there we have it. All right, everyone have a great day. Thanks for spending two hours, <laughs> two hours uh, working through this, but at least we finished it uh, and uh, we just took care of it instead of stopping and restarting. Hopefully it wasn't too irritating for everyone, but uh, we're done. And so everyone have a great day. God bless.